So anyway, we're yeah. saying the Meissner effect as applied to these claimed high temperature superconductors. In the experiments on the hydrides, people claim to have seen the first type of experiment where if you apply a magnetic field to a superconductor, it doesn't go inside, it gets repelled. But when they do the other experiment, which is they cool the system in the presence of a magnetic field, mm -hmm. they don't see a signal. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a red flag that says these are not really superconductors. And we'll see. Mm -hmm. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome to a very refreshing episode of the Into the Impossible podcast. Today we're joined by a renowned physicist, a condensed matter theorist, who happens to be the inventor of many things, including the indomitable, the, the precariously named H-Index, which I think is named after his last name, but this is Professor Jorge Hirsch of the University of California, San Diego. Jorge, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me, Brian. Apologize for the mix-up last time. Uh, it was t uh, totally unprofessional of me, but I had a little visitor, as you remember. Uh, and sometimes these things happen. But it's very gracious of you to I come back. Time commitment, so I yeah. apologize for And uh, this has been uh, a couple months coming since the announcement of a major discovery in the annals of physics, which could go down as one of the greatest discoveries of all time. could be worthy of a Nobel Prize, or it could be flawed could be a fraud it could be many many things that we are looking to you for interpretation uh, so the first thing I want to ask you is when did you become aware of these results uh, the first time uh, what sort of is the is the impact of superconductivity on physics and what does this all mean help us interpret it we're just simple cosmologists around here you mean when I became aware of which results the Diaz at all or the, the group ideas originally and got you interested in this in this particular yeah well on October um, 14 2020 uh, mm -hmm. Diaz and co-workers published the paper uh, with the title room temperature superconductivity in carbon ash sulfur hydride and mm -hmm. so I the same day I saw it and became extremely interested in it because as you well said, superconductors are fascinating, and uh, they are basically macroscopic quantum systems. And uh, if we have them at room temperature, then it's just amazing what you can do with it. Now, of course, that uh, paper um, was room temperature, but also very, very high pressures. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it a lot less interesting but still it's an enormous breakthrough because we have been looking for room temperature superconductors for 120 years or so <laughs> and the promise of those uh, room temperature superconductors will demonstrate here this is not a room temperature superconductor this is a, a piece of uh, yttrium copper barium oxide sometimes called yibico which needs to be cooled below its superconducting transition temperature, which is approximately 90 Kelvin 90 or so. Kelvin. So this is 77 Kelvin, uh, which of course is very balmy compared to what we do in the cosmic microwave background. Yes. But nevertheless, if you could have such a device, if you could have a true s levitating device, let me see, I'm gonna get some more liquid nitrogen. But um, describe the history of superconductivity and what does a theoretical condensed matter physicist do? And I'm just going to go get some nitrogen. All right. Keep it's a long story. Yes, it was please. discovered experimentally in 1911. And uh, it was immediately realized by its discoverer, Cameron Lyons, that this is an amazing thing, that the resistance of a metal when you cool, instead of gradually going down, at one point it suddenly drops to exactly zero. And exactly zero means that if you set up a current going, it will keep going forever. So it's really qualitatively zero, not quantitatively only. And um, of course, from day one, it was very important to understand why this happens and how can you make this happen at a higher temperature. And so for that, we need to understand why it happens and what characteristics of the material uh, favor this phenomenon and how can you modify the materials to make it happen at higher temperatures? So the original discovery was at uh, f uh, mercury at 4 Kelvin, I believe. And then people started working experimentally on trying to increase it and gradually went up to 
23 Kelvin over about the next 40 years or 50 years. And uh, the next big jump came actually only in 1986 with the high temperature superconductors where the temperature went from 23 Kelvin all the way to 90 and beyond. Um, so YBCO, which is the one you have, is 90 Kelvin, which breaks the nitrogen barrier. So nit liquid nitrogen is much cheaper than liquid helium. And so this, of course, was a big breakthrough. And then the temperature went up all the way up to 140 or 150 for these materials. Mm -hmm. All right, so as I say, it's a very long story. Let me try to shorten it. The, the thing is, in 1957, a theory of superconductivity was proposed, which um, is called the BCS theory, that is believed to describe what's called conventional superconductors. And it's generally accepted to describe all superconductors at low temperatures that were known at the time and others, but not these high temperature superconductors that cooperates, okay? And so the conventional theory is based on one basic interaction, which is called the electron-phonon interaction, which says that electrons will do this remarkable thing if they pair up. And in order for pair up, you need an effective attraction between them. And that, the BCS theory says, results from the motion of the ions as the electrons move they move the ions and in turn that creates an effective attraction between electrons. So it's an essential part of the theory and the one thing then it predicts is that for lighter ions you will get higher temperature superconductors. Mm -hmm. And so as you know hydrogen is the lightest atom we have. So the theory predicts that if you can make superconducting materials or materials that have a lot of hydrogen, you will uh, get higher critical temperatures. Mm -hmm. And there was a seminal paper by Ashcroft in 1968 where he specifically proposed to look for metallic hydrogen, which is hydrogen pressed to enormous densities so that it becomes metallic. That hasn't been achieved yet. But then in 2004, he proposed that if you mix up hydrogen with some other metals, you'll have an internal chemical pressure and you can achieve this high temperature superconducting state if you have an hydrogen uh, compound, it's called a hydride that has a lot of hydrogen and some other metallic elements. Mm -hmm. And so the, at that point, experimentally, people um, started working very hard to create these materials and they need to be created under pressure or at least it's easier and so the focus has been on these hydride materials under pressure. Is that to make the hydride form or is that to mimic the, rep uh, replicate some phonon interactions reminiscent well, of to conventional superconductors? To, to make it be a metal, mm -hmm. the hydrogens have to be, uh, the, ma the material has to be sufficiently dense. Mm -hmm. And usually, for example, if you have sulfur hydride, it's a gas, it's not a metal. Mm -hmm. And then you apply very, very high pressures to it, and it starts conducting electricity. And in fact, that material was claimed in 2015 mm. to be the first hydride, high temperature superconductor that was discovered. Oh, was it a copper? Was it also a copper hydride? No, 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 no copper. So yeah. we need to make a clear difference between the cuprates, mm -hmm. which is what you have there, mm -hmm. which we know are so-called high temperature superconductors, but High temperature means up to 150 Kelvin. And the hydrides that are claimed to be superconducting up to room temperature. Mm. And the big difference that I must say is important is the following. For the cuprates, everybody agrees that the interaction causing superconductivity is not the electron phonon BCS interactions. It's so another there are no, interaction. There are no Cooper pairs? In, uh, there are Cooper pairs, but they are not phonon formed. Generally. They're not generated by this electron ion interaction. So the mass of the ions is irrelevant. Mm. There is other mechanisms that people have proposed, which we can talk to if you want yeah. to, but they are not related to the electron phonon interaction. Instead, in the hydro materials, people believe that it is the original BCS electron phonon mechanism that's driving the superconductivity there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of paradoxical that 
you know, before the hydrides, it was thought that there was no way to get TTC with the conventional electron phonon mechanism, and you needed to find another yeah. mechanism like in the cuprates, and then suddenly the conventional mechanism became again the driving thing for Idea. high temperature uh -huh. superconductors, yes. Hey friends, just a quick request while you're enjoying this video to leave a thumbs up. My thumb's a little bit preoccupied with all Carl Sagan over here, but I hope yours is free enough to leave a like it really helps me with the algorithm. And for extra credit homework assignment, leave a comment down below what you're enjoying about this video. Now back to the show. And what have been your uh, contributions in this field? Uh, you know, I, I know about a great deal of your work as a condensed matter theorist, but uh, we haven't had many of those on the podcast. In fact, we've only had Felix Flicker recently on, but um, uh, he was one of the first uh, th theoretical condensed matter physicists. What do you do? What is, first of all, condensed matter physics? Anderson came up with that name. Um, is it a good name? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, he wanted matter. to generalize it from solid state solid. physics, and it's whatever you think. I don't <laughs> think it's particularly necessary, but uh, whatever. So I am interested in actual solids as opposed to more general condensed matter. Well, well, not quite. Uh, but uh, like, for example, liquid crystals would be some condensed matter that's mm -hmm. not a solid. Mm -hmm. But uh, the so. My interest is in collective phenomena in solids due to electrons deciding to somehow do something together as opposed to moving independently. And superconductivity mm. is clearly one such phenomenon. Other phenomena have to do with magnetism, for mm -hmm. example. Why iron is a magnet and aluminum is not, things like that. Right. But uh, so initially in my career I was focusing on general kind of correlated states of electrons in solids but then starting more or less like 30 years ago I focused uh, very much on superconductivity so uh, because you have a dot edu email address you are eligible to receive this piece of iron uh, also cobalt nickel any guess where this might have come from Jorge you didn't even have to join my mailing list at briankeating.com. No, where did this come list. from? This came from outer space. Cool. So this is magnetic material, cool. which has come from outer space. Cool. And it is highly magnetized. You can put it on there. You might not be able to get it back. Yeah. See, it jumped up. Stuart, get us on camera, on my camera, please, <laughs> so we can show the demo here. So you will get your own piece of space dust if you had a, have a .edu email address, because I, I love to reach out. And I will give this one to you. So and you didn't have to join my email list, although I hope then, you do it. Uh, the next time I come, you'll send me a superconductor from outer space? That's what I'm going <laughs> to ask you. So could it be that there are superconductors in space? Could it be uh, maybe not tangentially related, perhaps, to uh, our issues of dark matter? There are those who propose that dark matter could be a superfluid, including people like uh, past guest uh, Stefan Alexander, Justin Curie, uh, Sabina Hassenfelder. What do you think about the superfluid? Have you, have you paid attention to it? And uh, not very closely, but I do agree because I've paid a little bit of attention to superfluid helium, which mm -hmm. is a material we have on Earth, yeah. which has some very close similarities with superconductors and some important differences. But the, the basic phenomenon which share, they share, and I suspect in these other ideas in cosmology is microscopic quantum uh, coherence. Mm -hmm. Quantum coherence, phase coherence at a microscopic scale. That's what defines a superconductor and a superfluid. Now, uh, when I look at the, the field of, you know, so I still sometimes lapse and call it solid state physics. Um, I remember it was called squalid state physics, and yes. that's why Anderson reputedly wanted to perhaps change it. But nevertheless, um, I see a lot of acrimony, and it reminds me of some of the guests I've had uh, on the podcast that we talk about consciousness, and I ask them, what is consciousness, and what is possible to be conscious and they'll say things like an electron or a monkey or <laughs> in other words they can't really define it there's a famous essay by thomas nagel called what's it like to be a bat At the end he says <laughs> we don't know um so when i look at superconductivity it's it's pretty clear they talk about a couple of classical tests for what is a superconductor absence of electrical uh resistivity critical temperature critical um critical magnetic field curie temperatures things like that and then there's things you know subtle things like uh, magnetic uh, induction and, and so forth that we'll talk about 
Um, for these claims, it seems pretty clear cut. You could just, here's a chunk of material, give, give you some of it. And you can see if it has resistance, cool at room temperature, even, even, you know, a theorist can do that. No offense, uh, but you could do that. I'll have to give you the voltmeter down the hall right. and, uh, and we'll be able to get it. But, um, so what is so suspicious about it? What tests do these high temperature superconductors fail in your expert opinion? Well, I mean, the main problem with these hydride superconductors is that you have to apply very high pressure. And actually that was the case until the latest announcement in March that we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But before that, pressures were of around 200 gigapascal or at least over 100 gigapascal. And for those high pressures, you need a diamond anvil cell and you need to have a very small sample, mm -hmm. which is maybe at most 50 microns in diameter and a few microns in thickness. And so they are tough experiments. And when you measure things, um, First of all, there's a lot of background uh, that signals that can come in. And uh, it's just very difficult to, for example, when you measure transport resistance, what you really want is resistivity, mm -hmm. which is an intensive property as opposed to resistance that depends on the size of your so sample. Right. And if you look at all these hydride materials, they usually give you resistance, but they don't talk about resistivity because... And that's just for my audience that might not be familiar. It's resistance per unit length, essentially. Per unit length, uh, unit area, yeah, and yeah. so on. And because there is difficulty in knowing exactly what is the size of the sample and the geometry and so on, it's hard to estimate the resistivity. And so if you really could demonstrate, okay, the resistivity of this is two or three or four orders of magnitude less than that of a good metal, that would be very convincing, mm -hmm. but uh, that's people don't do that in the experiments. Right. Also, the experiments are not very reproducible. You do it once, you get one result. Mm -hmm. Even the same lab does it again. They get a different result mm -hmm. at, the, at a different temperature, a drop. Sometimes it drops to very small values. Sometimes it drops to finite values. And what's interesting is that for some reasons, the, the experimenters seem not to be very critical of the tests they do in the sense, in my opinion, mm -hmm. they rely very much on theory. So if a theory calculation tells them there has to be superconductivity in this material, they see some drop in resistance and they say, okay, that's it, we have found superconductivity. Even if the resistance then go to zero, they attribute that to, well, maybe there is some contact or some contact resistance or mm -hmm. some part of the sample that didn't go superconducting. Mm -hmm. And they do not, I believe, take into account that there is other reasons why a material under high pressure can undergo changes in resistance that are not superconductivity. Mm -hmm. Okay. But dramatically so, in the demonstrations that we'll talk about, it seems like there is a qualitative difference between an ordinary, you know, axial stress strain dependent resistance or resistivity uh, and these kind of, you know, near zero or close to zero resistivity measurements that they claim to have demonstrated. Although we can't say for sure because they're not replicatable right now, right? First, they are not replicatable. Then when you look at the papers, very often they don't tell you whether they are subtracting what they call the background resistance. Yes, you've, you've, particular, you've had particular attention to this. Yes. In particular, if you look at the latest paper, uh, on this lutetium nitrogen hydride, you look at figure 15, they show you curves that uh, drop and go to zero and continue at zero. But they happen to be honest enough because, and that's partly because of the history with this yeah. group, to say, well, we subtracted background resistance and they don't show you what the raw data looks like, but they did upload the raw data at the website because they were required to do so by nature. And if you now take those raw data and plot them, that same plot that in the paper looks like this and then zero looks like gradually coming down and doing nothing, okay? Hmm. And it's obviously no evidence for superconductivity, but after you subtract something, it looks like superconductivity. And you know, famously in my field of astronomy, you know, Edwin Hubble uh, published in 1929, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a plot of the recessional ve uh, velocities of galaxies versus distance. And this a particular plot, these data will show this on the B-roll background film that we'll show, along with the, the paper from Diaz's group. 
uh, the figure that you mentioned. And he plots it, and he shows these data points, and uh, they're just boxes. There's no error bars. The y-axis, instead of being labeled kilometers per second, just says kilometers. <laughs> right. And uh, there's some there's some strange scatter, and he fits a line through it. Okay, so famously, this is Hubble's law. The slope of that line it goes through. It's the simplest law possible. It goes yes. through zero. The slope is now called Hubble's constant h, which you would love. Uh, <laughs> little and actually, we use little h in many varieties throughout all of physics, from Planck's constant right. all the way up to uh, reduced. <laughs> Hubble constant. Now, um, he also got the slope wrong by a factor of seven. But is that important? Because the general law is, of course, correct. And it holds over not just uh, the, the 10 to 50 megaparsecs uh, that he looked at. It holds to thousands of megaparsecs. So uh, what's wrong with this, Jorge? I mean, just to be devil's advocate, if if indeed, look, this is you know very close to zero resistance. Uh, they're making a plot. They're subtracting stuff. Yeah, but even a great Hubble uh, could make error, uh, errors. Is this just a petty thing that scientists care about because of you know error bars here and there? One thing doesn't prove that. Uh, okay. The fact that Hubble turned out to be right <laughs> is great. Yes. The question is, is this true or not true? In science, we deal with facts. Exactly. So either this is a superconductor or it's not a superconductor. I'm convinced it's not a superconductor for many reasons. Okay, let's go through them. Okay, and uh, so it's something that needs to be determined. It's not a question like in other social sciences or political sciences where there can be different opinions. Right. Here, we will have an answer. All right. The long list of reasons why I don't believe in this yes. is very long. As long as you like. Okay. Well, it starts with a group that is publishing this paper. On the surface, the paper looks impressive. It has a lot of different measurements for superconductivity, resistance, AC susceptibility, DC susceptibility, specific heat, so, all right. Now, about this group, we need to remember that they published their first claim of room temperature superconductivity in 2020. The paper was retracted in September 2022. Why was it retracted? It depends who you ask. If you ask the journal, what they published is that they retracted it because it was not, uh, they used a non-standard procedure to subtract the background from the raw data to arrive at the published data. If you ask me and Dirk van der Marel, we work together on this, mm -hmm. it is because what they claim are the raw data that they measured in the laboratory are not measured, they are fabricated. Hmm. Fabricated, so we should stop there for a second. That's perhaps one of the most serious charges an academic could have leveled against them. And you have substantial reason to believe that. Uh, but as yet, we're still, uh, this is open to you know to debate. They can respond to this video. I've, I've actually asked him to come on the, not today, but come on the podcast anytime. I know you've corresponded with him. But just for my listeners, I have a lot of young you know, PhD students that listen to 100,000 plus strong undergraduates who are thinking about becoming condensed matter physicists. This is extremely serious. And, and I think to have someone of Jorge's caliber open, honest, and vulnerable enough to discuss this, this is a very rare treat for my audience. So I just want to you know, put a double click on that and say, this is an extremely serious allegation from an extremely serious group of scientists here against another group um, uh, where there's no there's no monetary reason. You're not doing this for fame, for attention. Uh, you're really quite a private person. So explain what this means, that it, that, it, that they're potentially okay. fraudulent. What it means, though, we published uh, two papers with Dirk, and in fact, I wrote the third paper, just four pages, trying to concisely show mathematically that this is fabricated. That paper was published today, coincidentally. Really? Oh, in the journal <laughs> Chemical Communications. Okay. As a that. comment on a paper that they published in Chemical Communications last year on the same material, CSH, that was the was the subject of a nature paper that was retracted. So in this paper, um, I published it as a comment. It was reviewed for seven months and the authors were invited to write a reply explaining why they don't agree with what I'm saying in the paper and they have not provided a satisfactory reply to a journal and the journal decided to publish my comment without a reply. Mm -hmm. I am sure that the journal will publish a reply if they submit one. 
But and that, I know my audience subscribes to this journal. I'm sure that they do. But so let's summarize. What are the uh, conclu- uh, the some of the some of the pieces of evidence that you bring against it, math- mathematically, physically, etc. Yeah. So they give so the susceptibility uh, shows a drop where the system goes superconducting. Susceptibility versus temperature. Okay, explain su- susceptibility as okay, a magnetic so, yeah. phenomenon. Magnetic susceptibility means the response to the system when you apply a magnetic field. When the system becomes superconducting, it responds differently than when it's normal. In particular, it doesn't like the magnetic field to penetrate inside its body, so diamagnetic. it generates diamagnet, it generates a current that prevents the magnetic field, it shields the magnetic Unlike field. Unlike this. Uh, meteorite or the one I've given you which is highly that's exactly the opposite ferromagnetic exactly they the couldn't opposite. be more opposite it's highly diamagnetic yes precisely go on and so you measure that susceptibility which uh, goes to a large negative value so the as a function of temperature there is a drop when this happens now because of this being a very small sample they have a background signal that they need to subtract and so what they publish in the paper is the raw data minus the background signal okay and that's called the signal so signal or yeah data equals raw data minus background signal all right so the data that they published have a very very peculiar structure and so we asked i asked them to provide the raw data and the background signal in order to understand whether these are real. And so it turns out that the data can be expressed by mathematical formulas. Mm -hmm. So the data versus temperature, there is to be specific 450 data points that are given to eight decimal places <laughs> we can uh, we can represent those 450 data points to eight decimal places by the sum of two mathematical functions one is a series of integer steps multiplied by one number which happens to be 0.16555 and the other function is a set of third order polynomials that can be uh, figure out what they are. The can, can I stop you for one second? Yes. Eight decimal places. Yes. So you're talking about uh, tens of nano. Um, this would be a nano. Oh, what's the unit of magnetic susceptibility? Well, no, they uh, measure voltage. So oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, so okay. Yeah. So that's that's a reason. Yeah. So, but they convert it to a number. I mean, are they saying they trust all those numbers? I mean, the implication, Jorge. Let's be honest. Is that this is. Reg- this is fit. I mean, they basically constructed a model. No, no, right? but the, it doesn't matter whether you trust them or not. Okay. They say that they measure this raw voltage to eight decimal places. Mm-hmm. What I'm saying is that I can mathematically calculate that raw voltage by using my formulas. And so if you take 450 and multiply by eight, how much is that? Three thousand or so. Thousands, yeah. That's the number of digits you need to reproduce the results. Now, in my, in my formula, instead of three thousand digits, I need like a hundred digits, okay, mm-hmm. to reproduce those three hundred digits that they say they measured. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. I I don't think you can explain that. Does that happen for any other super? Like, if you no, just no, took no, this superconductor, no. I mean, could you make uh, some function and say, if you do, let's say an alien or an artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm, you give it the magnetization, then it says, here you go, we fit to it, and oh, that's what uh, that's where the Cooper pairs form or something like that. Is it? It's totally it's impossible. impossible. Impossible that you would be fitting these, you know, measurements of noise, yeah. and so each one of these points has some noise. Yeah. And they give me the numbers, including the noise, and I have a mathematical formula that can fit the noise. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's yeah. impossible. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's the D- that's DC or AC magnetization. This is it's AC susceptibility, susceptibility which is measured by measuring a voltage in a coil with mm-hmm. a voltmeter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all these have to be done in the diamond anvil cell. In other yes. words, once you do it, are there? I mean, this is a side note, but 
if you let's say you put them in the anvil and then uh, press them and then there was some you know plastic deformation and it just remained ever forever these things don't have that phenomenon in other words you have to continuously apply pressure you do although this pressure is not so high right in the in the oh, most in the recent latest results. paper yeah. is not so high right but in the in the retracted paper the csh it was very high 200 gpa but yes these materials if you release the pressure they don't stay they stay they no. don't stay sorry mm -hmm. right so going back to the reasons mm -hmm. so one reason is look i can understand if people make mistakes i can understand if there is one member of a big group that does something that wasn't quite proper but to have the principal investigators refuse to answer questions about how was this obtained and explain so that one can reproduce what they say that was measured i don't think it's acceptable and that's why I cannot believe what they are saying now or trust what they are saying because they haven't responded to those very factual questions. So this speaks to their um, to their integrity as experimental scientists. Uh, one of the greatest and biggest challenges that a physicist has in an experimental field is not the measurement of a quantity like Hubble showed. It's the errors that you ascribe to that. And there are two different types of errors that can be ascribed. There are statistical errors, which can get better with repeated measurements of the same quantity. And then there are systematic errors, which must be removed <coughs> if and only if you can do another experiment that gets rid of the thumb on the scale or the excess resistivity. <coughs> Surely these people, they're an eminent institution in Rochester. I mean, they must know the concept of an error budget. Do they break out the statistical <coughs> and the systematic errors? I covered some of their findings. I showed their data in my previous video, which, which we'll get to because you had some criticism that I, I do want to learn what I did wrong because I'm always trying to improve and I can't resist with uh, such an eminent colleague uh, that uh, as yourself to, I need to know what I did wrong. Yeah. But I don't remember that they actually separated out the, in their air and provided an error budget. So Absolutely that's not. a huge red flag that I would think nature, yeah. although you know what the saying is about nature, just because it's in nature doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it was also in the New York Post and, and other journals. Yeah. So, so, so tell us, what are some of the other uh, red flags? All right, so that's, for this particular paper, the main red flag. Mm -hmm. Now, um, All right. So, so uh, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt, her, right. but let's say it didn't. Let's say the magnetic susceptibility is kind of wanky okay. and, and whatnot. But but let's say it still has zero resistivity. Uh, let's stipulate that. Um, well, how do we spec <laughs> stipulate that? Well, I mean, it, after you subtract the background, right? right. So after they sub subtract, the yeah. so there's two. Uh, there's multiple cascading errors. Is what is what yeah, we're you claiming. Subtract right? the background. They show in this latest paper. They show curves. Yes where they show one curve that is very broad, the resistance versus temperature, and then they say this is due to sampling homogeneities which happen in these small cells, and mm -hmm. that sounds reasonable. And mm -hmm. then they show another curve where the curves are a thousand times narrower. So right. the transition is incredibly sharp. And mm -hmm. uh, you don't expect that in a reasonable experiment, making the samples the same way, that suddenly the width of the transition will change by a factor of a thousand. Well. Now, red flag is that they measure voltage versus current, but they don't seem to find a critical current. It kind of rises slowly from zero, while in superconductors you expect that if you're at low temperatures for small voltage, you get, uh, so for small current, you measure voltage versus current, you have no voltage, and then at one point you have a threshold and you start developing voltage. They don't see that either. There's a critical current, all right, sorry to interrupt, but is it, essentially a different manifestation of a critical magnetic field? Absolutely. Okay, so Absolutely. Okay. That was figured out, yeah, by some famous person way back. Yes. Yes, yes. there's a relation between them. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, so again, so now it's multiple. I was envisioning yeah. that perhaps it is that, you know, it it's has zero resistivity. I mean, can you imagine such a thing? Could you imagine something that doesn't have a critical field or we can't measure its critical field. Let's say completely different group, you know, I yeah. come up, my, my kid comes down, makes a yeah. superconductor, your daughter, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Can you imagine, is it possible? To, like, what would they call such a material? No, superconductors have some properties that are common to all superconductors. Immutable. Right. Now, mm -hmm. there is some properties that can be different, but uh, there's some basic things that are the same. You need to have a critical current and you need to have zero resistance below that. The one other property that's very important and interesting is what's called the Meissner effect, mm -hmm. as you know. And there is two aspects of the Meissner effect that people sometimes confuse, which is one thing is to have a superconductor and apply a magnetic field, 
and the magnetic field doesn't penetrate. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens if I take a magnet and put it on top of an existing superconductor and it floats. All right, so we'll do that experiment now. Let's, let's okay. So hopefully this will this will work, but you know, we've had a it lot floats. of budget cuts. Right. It's sort of floating. Okay. It's not, not great. <laughs> Let me try another one. And it floats in a very different way, by the way, does it not, Jorge, than uh, just a normal magnet, right? So if I had a normal magnet, I'll see this A normal one. magnet cannot be in equilibrium with another magnet. There right. is something called Earnshaw's theorem. And that prevents yeah. it, unless yeah. it's an AC current, right? If yeah, exactly. AC current, you could yeah. do it. But these DC magnets, there we go. Yeah. All right. So now okay. the hope, of course, is that we are calibrated high temperature superconductor, not high temperature, it's a higher temperature uh, that superconducts. It's one of these cuprates. And it could be used, and the hope is that it'll be used for magnetic levitation, and we'll get to your hopes and dreams for truly room temperature superconductivity in uh, towards the very end when we talk about magical technologies and whatnot. Let's see how long that goes. So we we're talking about this theorem that prevents an ordinary magnet like this refrigerator magnet keychain. This could not do that, nor could this ferromagnetic meteorite that I've given you. Uh, but we could put people on top of this thing and turn it into a, a frictionless uh, or mo mostly frictionless travel uh, mechanism. So anyway, we're yeah. saying the Meissner effect as applied to these claimed high temperature superconductors. Let's continue. Yes, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I was going to uh, clarify an important distinction in the Meissner effect. The one thing is to have a superconductor and bring it close to the magnet and get this repulsion that mm -hmm. makes it levitate. Mm -hmm. A somewhat different process is where you have the magnet close to the normal metal when it's not cold yet. And let's say I take a piece of metal that's going to become superconducting, but it's not superconducting. I put a magnet on top, it just rests on it. And now I cool the system. Mm, mm -hmm. So that's a different phenomenon. It's flux trapping. Because No, because here Faraday's law plays a big role. When you're bringing the superconductor and the magnet close together, there's an induction due to Faraday's law. Mm -hmm. In the experiment I'm describing, you are just cooling, and there is no change from external change. And by itself, the superconductor will develop a current not induced by Faraday's law that will make the magnet rise so that it expels the flux. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is an important distinction of uh, the two experiments. And mm -hmm. um, in the experiments on the hydrides, people uh, claim to have seen the first type of experiment where if you apply a magnetic field to a superconductor, it doesn't go inside, it gets repelled. But when they do the other experiment, which is they cool the system in the presence of a magnetic field, mm -hmm. they don't see a signal. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a red flag that says these are not really superconductors. And um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. How much of the technological application could we get from uh, a low resistivity, but not maybe not zero resistivity, room temperature, ambient pressure, uh, material would that be as revolution? I mean, it certainly would be as revolutionary. Um, look, I think there is really a qualitative difference between zero resistance and small resistance, and I don't think it's actually feasible technologically to get non-zero small resistances. Mm -hmm. Either we succeed in making room temperature superconductors, or we don't. It's binary. And if we do, it's going to have lots of very important consequences what do you most I can't yeah i'm not the right person i know but what are you interested in? so here's my knock i'll, I'll be yeah. uh, i'll play devil's advocate again i hear a lot about quantum computers and how important they are and what yeah. they're able to do and we heard that the quantum computer teleported a wormhole and or to quant there's a lot of hype in science there is a little and 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 it's particularly yes. strong in what i do yeah. rare in what you do um but let, let's say uh, the you know you can make a superconductor what would that mean? I've always heard, you know, uh, Feynman talked about this, and I remember reading about it in the 80s and 90s. He said, you know, quantum computers are really good at uh, describing quantum mechanical Hamiltonians and Lagrangians. So, okay, that's great if you, I mean, I don't happen to need that for my iPhone. Uh, so is, is that really true? And and then what what is a quantum computer good, good for as far as you're concerned? Look, I'm not an expert in quantum computing. I can well imagine that if we are ever going to make a quantum computer, it's going to be with superconductors because yeah. superconductors are microscopic quantum systems. And if anybody has a chance of making a quantum computer, it's a system of superconducting 
Josephson junctions or whatever. And, uh, but, uh, you know, just the, 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 just having room temperature. Look, when the transistor when the transistor was discovered back in 1950, mm -hmm. it wasn't clear either that it will be everywhere. <laughs> in you know, 15 in million of them yeah, just exactly. In this, uh, That's exactly what would billion, happen sorry, with really. superconductors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I initially maybe you don't quite realize what it's going to. It's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. If uh, uh, so, the question is, is it possible? Okay, and. And how do we get there? That's mm -hmm. the key question. And so that's the question that I think the community is on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. And all this enormous effort and money that is being spent in this hydride superconductor research is misplaced, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, incentivization. People think of us as scientists as we're just very dispassionate. We just care about the truth. We stroke, you have a beard. I'm, I'm still kind of trying to grow a beard like yours, Jorge. Um, and we just sit around and we, we just really just think about what's good for nature and what Mother Nature or God or whatever will reveal to us. So um, I, I always think that's kind of bogus. I mean, scientists have very good qualities and we have very um, many say petty or less highly uh, refined let's characteristics. Let's talk about those. Yeah, let's talk about it. So the the propensity for for hype is is huge, especially in this in this little uh, it is. yeah. So talk about that. What what is what is what do you think if I, we're not we're doctors you and I but we're not psychotherapists. So what do you think's going on? Is it a fraud? I'll read from this New York Times article. I don't and this is from uh, Dr. Yeah. Strubble. A struggle says, I don't want to read too much into it, but there could be a pattern of behavior here. He's talking about Diaz. He really could be the best high pressure physicist in the world, poised to win a Nobel Prize. And you know how I feel about the Nobel Prize. Or there's <laughs> definitely something else going on. Same article by you, Jorge Hirsch. His complaints about Diaz grew so persistent and strident that others in the field later uh, circulated a letter complaining about decades of disruptive behavior by Jorge Hirsch. But Jorge said, in my opinion, the junk sometimes become conclusions. What did you mean by that? The I never said that. It says, well, this is the New York Times article. You never okay. said the, the okay. junk becomes conclusions? No. Let's talk about what that says. Yes, yeah, let's see it. There is a letter that, uh, in fact, the New York Times editor sent to me that I hadn't seen before. Apparently, has been circulating over the last four or five months, claiming that for the past 30 years, I have been doing disruptive behavior, which uh, I, yes, I would like to respond to it. Yeah, um, the person that wrote the letter has not made their name public, hmm. nor is the letter signed as far as I know, but I know some people that received it and so on. Well, the disruptive behavior refers to the fact that, yes, starting in 1989, I suddenly discovered a different way to explain superconductivity. Hmm. Um, um, at that time, we were all trying to understand the cuprates that had been discovered in 1986, and I came up with an idea of how to understand the cuprates, and immediately saw that that same idea can explain all superconductors, not just the cuprates which would mean that the electron phonon mechanism that is part of the conventional theory does not really apply. It's not responsible for superconductivity in any material. <laughs> I came to that conclusion back in 1989. And so since then, I've been working on that hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, you know, I have made a lot of progress. And it took me like a very long time to understand certain things, in particular the Meissner effect that I was telling you about, which I finally understood only like six years ago or so, all based on the same basic idea that is different from the conventional idea. Now, my understanding has a lot in common with the conventional theory, but it has some fundamental differences. Anyway, ever since I came to that realization, I've been writing papers, developing the theory, and questioning the validity of the conventional theory. And that uh, has not gained me a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. I have had very much trouble publishing the results. I have published a lot of papers on this, mm -hmm. but uh, not on the most highly, you know, prestigious papers, li uh, journals like Science or Nature. And, um, and so 
for reasons I don't quite understand, the theory is not uh, considered valid by many people. I think some people find it interesting, but people, uh, what happens in science is people don't address questions, for example, they just ignore. So if I write the paper saying the BCS conventional theory cannot explain the Meissner effect for this reason and this reason and this reason, in order to explain the Meissner effect, you need to have this physics that the conventional theory simply doesn't have. Sometimes we solve problems and I don't have to tell you this in quantum mechanics or classical mechanics by doing separation of variables. Okay. We take um, the radial part, we separate the radial part from the angular, azimuthal, and polar angle. Why combine both the refutation of the BCS theory with a concomitant new theory? Why not separate those variables? Um, we can. But I've tried to do that too. I've written papers simply addressing what's wrong with BCS theory. And that's not accepted? No. Really? No, people simply ignore them, it, those papers. So it, the conventional wisdom for my audience is saying that the BCS theory, it, uh, co-invented by my graduate quantum mechanics professor at Brown University, Leon Cooper, who's still very much alive and well, Yes. Uh, uh, allegedly on the uh, four train in, in Brooklyn in 1957 or whatever, um, that that theory is incapable of of explaining one of the hallmarks of, of superconductivity, in fact, one of the motivations for the demonstration. Th that's what you're claiming. The Meissner okay. effect and in particular. And the expulsion of magnetic fields, yes. Are there any unique observables or experiments that could be done to either falsify the BCF, the BCS theory or to motivate uh, your theory, Jorge? Yeah, there are experiments that could be done to validate what I'm saying happens in superconductors mm -hmm. that have not been done. Uh, the physics I'm talking about is extremely simple. Hmm. Maybe I can even yeah. try to explain it, it to yeah. you. A superconductor, as I say, when it goes from normal to superconductor, will expel magnetic fields. In order to do that, it has to start generating a current near the surface that generates a magnetic field opposite to the one that's applied. Lenz's law. And right. no. Or no? No. Faraday? No. Really? It's actually the opposite of Lenz's law. Really? Okay. Lenz's law says that the metal wants to oppose changes in magnetic flux. Okay. And so you start with a metal that has magnetic flux in it. Lenz's law says it doesn't want to change that. Instead, it, wants to it expels it. That's expel exactly the opposite of what Lenz's okay. law tells it so it should be doing. I was conflating expel with no, opposition. No, it's very important. Yeah, though. it is important. No, you're correct. Because it says if for some reason somebody wants to expel those lines, let's just law should oppose it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm saying BCS theory has no explanation of how you generate that current opposing Lenz's law, doing the opposite of what electromagnetism wants. When we write down and the Schrodinger equation yes. in for the Cooper pairs, I mean, how do we make the quantum to classical transition. I mean, where a current is something macroscopic. We don't usually think about currents in, in quantum mechanical terms in the Schrodinger equation. How does that operationally occur? Again, I'm a simple cosmology experimentalist, so, but I know it must involve some Ehrenfest theory. Uh, there must be some transition between the quantum and the classical regime. No, well, you can write the current operator in quantum oh, yeah, mechanics the and, yeah, and right. compute the expectation value mm -hmm. and the time evolution and so on. And that would give you the classical. And the problem is in the BCS calculation, they don't do the actual calculation of the process whereby you start with the magnetic field inside because that's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. All they do is they compute the energy of the state when the magnetic field is out already, and they find that it is lower than the energy of not having expelled the magnetic field. Oh, I see. But that is not, not the same. enough. Right, so it's an energy to, argument, right? And you have to you explain can. momentum conservation and how do you go from here to there. Charge conservation, yeah. And mm -hmm. The explanation is extremely simple. Let me tell it to yeah. you because it's very simple. It's something that anybody can understand. It's based on the following. Lorentz force, as you know, tells us that when a charge moves, there is a velocity uh, there's a force due to the magnetic field that is a cross product of velocity times magnetic field. Correct. If you look at the superconductor and you think 
about what happens if electrons were to be flowing from the inside outward as it goes superconducting, you will find that the Lorentz force will deflect those electrons and create a current that will expel the magnetic field. That is a very simple concept, mm -hmm. and it tells you that the transition to superconductivity has to be associated with a motion expelling electrons. Very simple mm -hmm. concept that is totally it's foreign. It's classical too, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's foreign to the conventional BCS theory that mm -hmm. says none of that ever takes happens. place. No pairs, no, oh, I see, uh-huh. Now, you also need pairs to get everything to work, but this basic phenomenon that unless you have a radial charge flow, it's almost a mathematical theorem that if you don't have radial charge flow, you cannot oppose Lenz's law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. a consequence of the curl. It's basically what happens in plasmas. In plasmas, there's something called Alfven theorem. I don't know mm -hmm. if you know that yeah. Alfven was a he professor was here. here. Yeah, of course I do. He got yeah. the Nobel Prize, yep. among other things, for Alfven theorem that is basically just saying when you have a conducting fluid and magnetic field lines are moving in it, it's because the fluid is moving with the field line. So mm -hmm. there is motion of charge and mass when the magnetic field lines move. Mm -hmm. So that basic concept is missing in the in the conventional. Convention on this now. I see. Now another wrinkle um, in this story is the um, is the intellectual property rights that Diaz and and his company have asserted. So he's created a company called Unearthly Materials, and you know, Jorge, you and I are are public, you know, university professors. Uh, we we don't get paid that much, but we do what we do because we love it. Um, but you know, if an opportunity came along to you know patent some, I have two patents. I've got pictures of them somewhere. Cool. I've made exactly zero dollars from my two okay. pads. Uh, but but tell me, um, is that a red flag? Honestly, to you, it isn't to me. But but tell no, me, no, what do you think? No, no, it's not a red flag. That, okay. uh, but in the in the context that we are, they are using that as an excuse to not share samples. Of course, this can be settled in in, in one day. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> in the latest claim, they can just ship a sample to our colleague Brian Maple that has been doing experiments on superconductors. National for Academy uh, member, former chair of the department. 60 years maybe or 50 yep. years. And he could check in a day whether this is true or not. They say because of proprietary interests of the company, they mm -hmm. cannot do that. So how can you patent an element uh, or you know a compound like this? I think you can. So there have been patent fights over YBCO, as far as I know. So really? Yes. Really? So you ca I can't just go out and synthesize my own. I mean, also, there's another wrinkle, which is that there's a stoichiometric factors. And, uh, you know, I failed uh, high school chemistry, so I, I can't even remember well, these things. But there are these deltas. And, uh, you know, it seems like the recipe is like one day you can get a souffle and the next day you get a chicken exactly. salad. Uh, they say one third of the time they get a super con uh, two thirds they get chicken Total salad. Total crap. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, look. And, I don't know. Yeah, we are we are talking for a long time. Yeah. There's a lot of other things I wanted yeah, please to go. address, let's, let's but go we don't have the time. Or well, we have I a few have more minutes. I had a lot yeah. of trouble mm -hmm. with archive. I don't know if you know that. I know about that. I know you were banned for six months, allegedly because yes. of uh, the the. Imp well, you explain yeah. why. Why? What was the reason they gave? I and want what to is your reaction that to? because please I do. am extremely upset and still please very do. upset with the whole situation with archive. I submitted the paper to Physica C, the journal. Yep in August 2021 because for eight months I was trying to get the raw data for the DS susceptibility measurements and they were refusing to give them out. Claiming patent reasons that were totally transparently not applicable because this is just a simple measurement. All right. So I wrote this paper to Physica C, I sent it to Physica C saying um, these are just probable fraud. That was the title of the paper. The title of the paper. Yeah. So uh, Archive got that paper and they put it on hold, which I totally understand. They want to think about it's a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. All right, one month later, Physica C published it online. And another month later, after the Archive moderators had considered it and thought about it, I didn't do anything. I let them do their job. They posted it online. Mm -hmm. So that means they cleared whatever moderation standards they have. So Correct. they posted it online in October. Magically, then in December, they wrote to me saying that my papers are improper and they are saying things that accuse of people of fraud. And so they removed the paper. And uh, my first question is, well, you know, you analyzed the paper for two months and then you posted it. So it's your problem. It's not my problem <laughs> if the paper is doing right. something you think is improper. 
And at the same time, what was happening is they finally had released the raw data DS at all. And I started analyzing them. And I found immediately that there were very clear anomalies with the raw data. And so early December, I submitted two papers to archive, not saying fraud, simply doing a very dry analysis of the raw data, saying that uh, there is a problem here. And, and they claimed you had gotten that data via some means? No, no, oh no, no, no. The, the raw data were published they're by they're Diaz totally, okay. and co-workers on archive mm -hmm. in early December. So immediately after they were posted, not just for me, for everybody, I started analyzing them and I sent them some papers with the analysis. Now I was careful because I and didn't say anything like fraud. They still say, no, we are not going to post this. So they didn't post anything. I kept sending them papers. And then sometime in early February, they banned me for six months because they said I was doing improper things. So there's several things that are wrong here, mm -hmm. I think, which is Diaz was publishing you know, his raw data and claiming that they are valid. I'm analyzing the raw data and have mathematical analysis that shows anomalies that I think the community should consider. Mm -hmm. Archive decides, no, you cannot publish that. And you got banned. And then I get banned so for six months. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, And you couldn't appeal. No, of course, I tried to appeal. And but it didn't go no. anywhere. No, right. Mm -hmm. right. So I believe what happened is that at some point after uh, Archive posted my original paper saying probably fraud, Ranga Diaz or Ranga Diaz and co-workers mm -hmm. wrote to Archive saying we're going to sue you if you don't do something because this is not true, okay? And so they did not want to get sued. They didn't want to pay lawyers to defend against what would have been a frivolous lawsuit because Defamation means that you're accusing somebody of something that is not true. If you're accusing somebody of fraud and it is true, it's not defamation. But also it's a private, in the private con, if I say, you know, Jorge likes to take, you know, high altitude balloons and push monkeys out of them, then that's your private citizen. If I say your research is wrong that you published in a journal and, all, and I say that is, that has yeah. elements of fraud, that is, doesn't meet the standard of, at least in the United States. Right. They might claim because it was published in nature, there's different yeah, standards. And I didn't can, say private fraud. The initial a paper to Physica C was basically saying, look, there is these anomalies that I cannot explain. They mm -hmm. don't prove fraud for sure. Yeah. But the fact that they are not releasing the data, the data when they, you know, specifically say in the published paper, the data are available and mm -hmm. they are refusing to release them. That's a very big red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about journals for a second yes. um, before we finish up. We yes. have a couple more segments uh, that I just want to yes. ask you some existential questions. I know you yes. don't usually like to answer these types of things, but I'll, I'll ask just one with your forbearance. But before I do that, um, you are known for the uh, creation of the, of the H index. Um, can you describe what motivated you to do that and uh, what, what, it's, what it's become and where you might see it going? It's not the only of its kind, but it's certainly been very influential. You can find on Google Scholar. You can find, what's your H index? I think? My H index, I think it's... Uh 69 maybe i'm okay. not quite sure all right elon musk approves <laughs> uh so uh so tell me what what how did this uh, well, how, how did this, this come about I, yeah i've always been interested in objective criteria for judging scientists as opposed to opinions mm -hmm. and so i always used to look up citations of people when we we're considering for hiring and so on and so forth in the old days, I had to go to the library and look at these big uh, books. I don't know if you still remember <laughs> yeah, those. I, remember those, uh, uh, I found them extremely informative. And so, uh, you know, but it's a lot of information. And to collect all that information and discuss it, it gets cumbersome. And then, you know, I, I just started. And it was at the same time the Web of Science was coming uh, online. And so you could find the citations online. And I found that there was this nice way to compress a lot of information into a single number that has a lot more information than other single numbers. For example, the number of publications by itself can tell you very little. The number of ci total number of citations by itself can tell you very little mm -hmm. because of various reasons, right? And so I used this for two years. I shared it with my colleagues. And then at some point, I wrote the preprint. I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And somebody contacted me from Germany, uh, an experimenter is named Manuel Cardona, who was uh, 
an extremely prolific writer and good science, excellent scientist. And uh, he had heard of it through word of mouth and thought that was very interesting. And well, at that time I had already written a little preprint that I had circulated among colleagues, but I didn't know what to do with it. So mm -hmm. when I got this email from this person in Germany, I decided to post it on archive. Mm -hmm. And I posted it on archive, again, not knowing whether I would publish it or not publish it. And I started getting calls from journalists asking me about this for some reason. I thought, wait a minute. I mean, I've written very many <laughs> more interesting <laughs> papers. Why right. am I getting right. calls on this? My 1989 on paper, yeah. <laughs> right. And um, yeah, so. Well, there's something, the phenomenon, because you're not on social media, there's a phenomenon of, you know, it's, it's, called, uh, it's called gamification. So you want to see after this video is posted, I'll, uh, I'll see how many thumbs up the video <laughs> got. I'll compare it to when I have Felix Flicker on. And okay. that's a reminder to everyone to not only subscribe, you know, that only 80, only 20% of the people watching actually click subscribe. So please do subscribe. Please leave a thumbs up. We want to have more conversations with brilliant luminaries. But that's a gamification. Facebook. Okay. Okay. Twitter, there are all these things, and it kind of maybe came about as a social phenomenon, although you didn't intend to no. become a social scientist, no, no. but you did. Yeah. And now we make the basis for hiring, or at least in part, not in, uh, entirely. Yeah. But I wonder yeah. how you feel about that as well. But that's a conversation uh, yeah, well, another time. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a long conversation, but yeah. I have mixed feelings about it, mm -hmm. let's say. Right. I mean, I think it's very useful for getting a quick impression of somebody, but you certainly have to look much further and look at the details and mm -hmm. it can be very misleading it might be also. Necessary but not sufficient. No, no, and it can be misleading mm -hmm. also. So it's there's some danger. So uh, how how has it been misused in your opinion? Or give me an example. No, I just think that you can have very different profiles of publications. Somebody that uh, writes papers just by themselves or with a couple of co workers, other people that write with a group of ten or fifty or a hundred people. And their age index can be the same, but their contributions can be very different. And mm -hmm. so if you just rely on the age index and don't take into account uh, that factor, right. you can be misled very, very clearly. Many uh, age since PhD, uh, you know, yeah, kind of institution. Yeah, the age since PhD, I did, I did discuss that in my original paper, and mm -hmm. that's, that's easy to take care mm -hmm. of because I basically defined actually an index with a ratio between the age index and the number of years since the first publication, which kind of normalizes for... And what about the field differences? You know, my field, you, you might have no papers for several years. Your experiment gets built. You take uh, data. Again, you write a dozen yeah. papers, right? Of so course. Same it's thing. field dependent. Mm -hmm. so you should really not compare H indices across, across very different fields. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous, yes. What about across continents and, and different, uh, you know, institutional biases that may be present? I don't think that's so important. Mm -hmm. I think uh, within, like, on this matter of physics, I would happily compare H indices of people mm -hmm. in the U.S. or China or Europe or wherever. When I researched my first book, Losing the Nobel Prize, um, I came upon some statistics that it was very rare. It almost never happened that someone won the Nobel Prize but had not been elected to, say, the National Academy of Sciences. Are there other correlations that have been uh, observed by you and, and others uh, about, the, say, the Nobel Prize or uh, admission into the National Academy or other things like that that you're aware of? With the age index, you mean? Yeah. Well, in particular, Manuel Cardona, who was the one that got very interested in this initially, that's the first thing he did. He calculated the age index of everybody that had been one uh, Nobel Prize or <laughs> accepted to the National Academy in the last few years mm -hmm. and, and, and found correlations. Oh, really? So, uh -huh. yes. so there is obviously some correlation. Yeah, and we, ha we have standards here when we go up for promotion yes. every three years to get a $50 raise every month right. or whatever we get. <laughs> right. You know, they'll, they'll say this. And it yeah. becomes exponentially hard to grow, right? It starts to, start to saturate. That's what's attractive about yeah. it. I think one of the things that's attractive is that when you are starting, it's easy to increase your age yeah. index by it's, one, right? It's <laughs> fun, right? I get an email from Google Scholar every <laughs> week. I just went up by one. I'm right. 51 now, uh, yeah, which cool. is my age. So that's pretty cool. Right. Uh, so age since PhD is right. about 25. So we'll see if, if I could ask the master for that. Uh, right. Jorge, we don't have that much yeah. time left. You've yeah. been so generous with your time. First of all, um, I did a video previously in which I mentioned uh, some things. I want to give you a chance to respond. You said that there were some important I, errors that the audience would be left with. I'd be remiss as a host if I didn't ask you. I'm sorry. Please correct I, me. I do not remember the, all the details. The one thing I re do remember is that you did not make a clear distinction, which we have done in our conversation today, between what's understood to be conventional superconductors and unconventional superconductors. Fair enough. You did not make that decision. And that's very important it is to very understand important. that the cuprates, You're everybody right. accepts and believes it are unconventional. Mm -hmm. The hydrides, uh, everybody believes are the conventional BCS mechanism. And I disagree with uh, that there. 
the BCS mechanism and that, but th that distinction I think is important for important. understanding the I appreciate that controversy. Um, so the last question I was going to ask you are you going to try to um, patent the H index like Diaz and all or pat no, no, just uh, kidding no. Jorge just kidding uh, but there is one question I always ask my uh, guest if you're willing to, uh, uh, to to sort of address it it's it's an existential question and it owes to the namesake of the uh, of the organization that I'm the associate director of, which is called the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And Sir Arthur said many things. You've heard me say this in a faculty meeting, quoting after him, f that for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. Um, he used to say things like that. Uh, he also said the following. T I'll, I'll give you two of his quotes, and then I want you to respond to one or both. He said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I want to ask you first, what is the most magical thing in all of physics that if we were to summarize um, what humanity has come up with in physics, as Feynman said, it was the atomic hypothesis. That was like the coolest thing, the most important thing, the most basic fundamental truth that could be expressed in the fewest words. Jorge, to you, what is the most magical thing that you've ever encountered as a scientist? Oh, that's a really tough question. Look, I, I mean, if you ask me about all of physics, what I find the most amazing in some sense is uh, Maxwell's equations. I just <laughs> love Maxwell's <laughs> equations. I mean, the fact that he could express so much and so many different phenomena in those four equations, I think it's just a miracle. Yeah. And, um, and of course, he was, he, I often point out uh, that his original model, like Hubble, uh, in some sense was flawed, right? He believed in these vortices. He was, it was not eddy. flawed. It was very f intuitive, very physical. Mechanical, mechanical. Yeah. I appreciate that very much. It mm -hmm. wasn't based on very formal mathematics. It was based on physical intuition. Yes. And I think that is really, really important. Very good. There is one subject that we didn't touch on, even though mm -hmm. you mentioned it, this issue about hype and yeah. all that yeah, let's, and where let's it comes from. It. I just want to say that I think there's a big problem with the way research is funded and people are driven to make these claims and hype things because of funding mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know, I think there, there should be possible improvements in the way science is funded so that not so much funds, taxpayers' funds are wasted on hype that is not real. Yeah, I, I agree with you and, and part of the mission of this podcast, which you know you may have looked at maybe once in your life, but um, I do it because the public pays our salary, right? So right. not just because we're public uh, university professors, but every scientist in America and around the world is supported at some exactly. level by his or her in government institution. Right. Now, what do we get out of that as a taxpayer? I find we don't give back very much to the taxpayers. We say we're doing something very esoteric. Right. You can't understand it. Right. Um, and uh, even if you could understand it, I have better things to do with my time. Right. I think that's horrible, not only for the public who pays our salary, but for scientists as well, because the minute the public loses confidence Absolutely. in what we're doing, they're gonna stop funding Absolutely. us. So it's very dangerous. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I call it the academic media hype complex, which is that we have these media offices here and University of Rochester has a media office, right? right? <laughs> very so, powerful. <laughs> one, yeah. So once you start going, um, and then you get a hint, and yeah. then and then maybe you need to get you know tenure, or maybe a graduate student needs a postdoc, or maybe the postdoc needs a, it's very, very tempting. And it's so hard, as Feynman said in his famous uh, um, essay at Caltech commencement in 1964 or five or whatever, he said, you know, I hope you never have to sacrifice your integrity to uh, to get attention to your results or to what you do as a scientist. Because that when that happens, not only will your own integrity be compromised, but the public's confidence right, in exactly. how integrity is maintained in science will be undermined. Anyway, Jorge Hirsch, professor of physics. Uh, you predate me by, by some years. Uh, I've been privileged to know you for 19 years now. It's our 19th anniversary. And uh, I just want to say uh, I thank you for your integrity and your courage. And I, I always say one, one last piece of advice, although I hate, I know you hate to do these things, but I can't resist. Um, the name of the podcast is called Into the Impossible, which is another quote of Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who said the following. He said, the only way to know what's the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And I like to re invert that and say, Jorge, if you could talk to 20-year-old Jorge Hirsch, what one piece of advice would you give him to give him the courage to do as you've done to go into the impossible? Is that the question? That's the question, yeah. What, you're teleported for 30 seconds back to see young Jorge. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> I, um, look, I, I, I find myself very fortunate to have stumbled upon things that I think 
I would never have imagined that uh, made me understand things that I never understood. Would there have been a way to make things so that I would have made more progress in getting others to pay attention and join in trying to understand these things? And I probably wasn't good enough at doing that. And I don't know. Perhaps I would advise my younger <laughs> self to try to do that better. Fair enough. Well, Jorge, you've been an inspiration to many of us throughout your career. I find you not to be disagreeable at all uh, or whatever you were <laughs> accused of in this uh, in this letter nailed to the cathedral door of physics in the Cathedral of New York City, the New York Times, whatever that is. Um, thank you so much. I do want to, again, extend uh, a request to my listening audience, a couple of requests. One is to sign up for my mailing list where you can get a ferromagnetic sample of the early universe that's 4.3 billion year old, it fell in Argentina of all places, uh, Campo de Cielo, which Jorge can pronounce cool. better than me. And it was found uh, about 500 years ago. The natives used it for tools and so, so forth. We now use it uh, to, to talk about the formation of the solar system and the dust that's contained within our galaxy. But more than that, I encourage you, if you have a .edu address, email address, sign up for my mailing list, briankeating.com. And you will guarantee to win one of these. And if you don't have a .edu email address, sign up anyway. I give away 100 of these on a regular basis, so you can still win. Second of all is if anybody is in contact with Professor Diaz, uh, I would love to have him on the podcast to, to, um, to address some of the conversation that I've had about him and others have had about him. And my last request is to leave a thumbs up uh, on this uh, on this podcast or wherever you're listening to it. Leave a review if you like to have uh, more guests on that are doing the cutting edge at the highest level research that you could imagine. Uh, I will I will let you know. Also, I should tell you, uh, Jorge, I had a guest on David Friedberg, who is a billionaire investor and incredible intellect. And when he was on, he was on in February before the announcement, and he claimed that he would uh, he would cut off his right arm to get room temperature superconductivity. Cool. So, David, I think Jorge, uh, you owe Jorge uh, a great deal of gratitude for saving your right arm. <laughs> anyway, that's all from the Into the Impossible Studios. Thanking you so much. Stay tuned for the next episode right here.